So we're kind of in part two of this series called I'm In. And, uh, and now we're going to begin to go through these four words that we've had behind us. Which, by the way, if you haven't noticed, um, I use the different material. We normally use these nice, like, things that roll over. And, and this month I used this vinyl that I put the grommets in and uh, was trying to save money. Um, we, we're going to come out next week and shoot our final video for the capital campaign uh, to purchase the property. And I know it's only, it was saved us like 100 bucks per banner. And so I was like, you know what? It's worth the time right now. So it doesn't look as nice uh, as maybe like these cloth ones does. Um, but right now we are all in on doing whatever it takes um, to raise the funds that we need in order to purchase the property. And we'll have kind of the final details come out here in the next two weeks. So we're going to go over these four words. And I want to kind of introduce the concept and then we'll jump into this week. Uh, today we're going to talk about I'm invited. So say it with me. I'm invited. One, two, three. I'm invited. We want you to know that you are God's, you're invited to God's family. The next thing is, I'm invaluable. Say, I'm invaluable. You're invaluable to God's work. And then we're going to talk about in week three, I'm influential. Say, I'm influential. You are influential for God's glory. And then last week, we're going to say, I'm invested. There you go. I'm invested in God's church. And today we're going to go to really what is the core concept to the gospel. When we say the words, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So the gospel is a New Testament idea. There was no gospel in the Old Testament. Um, there was laws and there was a lot of different regulations, but there wasn't this good news that we get to share of the freedom that we have in Christ. And this idea that you are invited to God's family is the very core of what we believe is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we all know it's like the worst feeling when all of a sudden, like the next day, uh, maybe you look at social media or you see something and, and you realize that all your friends had a party that you weren't invited to. Like that's just the worst feeling if there's something that you feel like you were supposed to be invited to and then you weren't. Or even maybe it's the situation where you've had to move away from family or you're working or serving in the military and this event happens and you weren't able to be there. And it's just the worst feeling that you wanted to be a part of something and you felt like you weren't invited. Well, I've got one fill in the blank for you today, so don't miss it. And it's this core concept that Jesus invites the people that others reject. That Jesus invites the people that others reject. That perhaps religion despises. That others overlook. That people that don't feel like they're good enough. That you're invited to be a part of God's family because Jesus invites everyone. So we see this story in Luke 7. Uh, so we know it happened about 2,000 years ago. And if you don't know, when Jesus walked on earth, he claimed to be God. At this point, he had already read the passage from Isaiah 61. He had kind of already declared his lordship. And you begin to hear as they're asking these questions like, who is this guy who forgives sins? By the way, if you haven't realized it, one of the core concepts that you find out about Jesus throughout all the Gospels is that he can read people's minds, that he knows what we're thinking, and it kind of comes out indirectly in this passage. But at this point, many people, even the disciples, they weren't sure if they should believe this claim that Jesus was making, if he was God. Because here's what's so interesting is, if he was God, everybody assumed if God God came, the Messiah came, who would be his favorite people? His favorite people would be the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of the church, the people who had this outwardly pious attitude. They wore the, the special clothes. They were devout religion. They, they never missed a worship service. They were serving in the temple. They knew all 613 laws. They had all the ritualistic ordinances where they would do these extravagant cleansings of their bodies to prepare them for sacrifices in the be in the temple. That they did everything they could in their life to not just stay sinless, but also to stay away from anybody that was sinful. In fact, if they were walking on the street and a person that they believed was sinful was walking nearby, um, they would either go to the furthest possible way or, and there's still parts of Jerusalem, if you walk through, this could happen today, they will yell at you and, and 
you know, wave their arms and their sticks and, and threaten you to get away from them. Um, because they believe that they had to stay completely separate and away from anybody who had any kind of sinful lifestyle inside of them. Well, I'm going to kind of paraphrase the story that Rob read for us so well in Luke 7. So one day, a Pharisee, a Pharisee named Simon decided that he was going to throw a party. Now, you have to know that the party that he had back then was probably different. They're not going to have hot dogs um, at their party, uh, not even Hebrew national hot dogs. That wasn't going to be like on the menu. Um, they weren't going to be like, you know, inviting like the, the hottest band in town to come and play. Um, it was actually more of a public discussion to show off their knowledge. And most likely they would have been eating in kind of the outer room. So all the way on the edge, um, perhaps even in a courtyard, uh, depending upon the season, and they would have been eating in the courtyard or the outer room. And then what people would do is they would kind of come and they would kind of uh, watch, like these are the who's who of Pharisees that were coming. This is a, a red carpet type event. And so like, you know, their version of uh, paparazzi, like the people who want to give the good, good gossip, they're going to come and be as close to the door, as close to the outer room, or, or even watch in the courtyard this conversation. You know, they would see kind of like what color of tassels that they were wearing for this event. Um, and they would actually watch some of the cleansing that they would do. And, and this meal would take place. And as the door is open, they would hear, you know, social trends. They would hear politics. They would hear how much they hated the Romans. Um, and they would also talk theology. Um, and they would talk about, you know, anything that was happening kind of around. There was no internet. There was no TV. Um, you know, and this was the men that was speaking. So this was not like the real housewives of Jerusalem. This was the men that were speaking. So it probably wasn't super entertaining. Um, but this was like what people would come to see. And then all of a sudden, this incredibly shocking event happens. And I really can't preach it or teach enough for you to truly understand how shocking this moment was. When the who's who of Pharisees in Simon's own house, a woman who could not even walk on the same side of the street of them enters into his home. I mean, the, the idea of people just being shocked is, is probably minor. There was probably some who physically stood up and were threatening towards her um, as she came in. It says in Scripture, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. Now, that's code word for she was a woman who worked the streets. I don't know if her name was Roxanne, but she put the red light out. We used to use that song for youth group, by the way, for a game. And... Uh, Whenever the kids would say Roxanne, they would have to eat cheese puffs. And when it said red light, they had to chug out of a two liter bottle of soda. And whoever did the best won. And I don't think we ever realized what the song meant. But um, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. So she finds out that Jesus is there. And we're going to see that she decides to come into this place knowing that she's not invited. She's not welcome. The Pharisees speaking these eloquent speeches on the uh, ontological argument of pneumatology. So like the deepest theological words they could come up with, which is what I came up with in my notes, by the way, uh, that I could share. And a call girl walks into the house of the leaders of the church. She walks into this party. The Pharisees were raged in protest. She can't. She's unclean. You know, she didn't go through the elaborate rituals that we did. She's unworthy. She's impure. She doesn't belong here. She wasn't invited. But Jesus sees something different. He sees a hurting woman. A woman who maybe made bad choices or simply had bad circumstances. He sees a woman who probably didn't grow up and all of her friends saying, well, I want to be a teacher. I want to sell real estate. Well, guys, I just want to work at night and just sell my body to the highest bidder. I don't think that's the outcome that she wanted for her life. Never wanted this. Perhaps she had a father who didn't protect her. Perhaps she was abused. Perhaps her parents died. She was the oldest sibling. Her younger ch uh, siblings were starving in the only way that she could get money was to choose this lifestyle. 
Maybe she had a boyfriend who pressured her and she got pregnant young. And then he, as well as everybody else, said that you're unworthy and unclean. She felt rejected, unemployable. She felt guilty. Her whole adult life, think about this. Men used her and abused her and every woman looked down on her. Everywhere she went, which is why in a different story, there's a woman at the well at the hottest time of day that Jesus also loves. But she comes in and she falls to her knees in a posture of worship, humility, and she comes to the feet of Jesus. She doesn't worry about what anybody else is saying. And she runs directly to Jesus. And she takes this jar of perfume and she breaks it open. And she pours it across Jesus' feet. She takes her most valuable possession, probably a year's worth of salary, she takes it and she pours out this great wealth on Jesus' feet. And she also abandons her ability to go back to her lifestyle. As she takes her business card, the smell of perfume, because the average woman couldn't afford it. But if you walked past a woman who smelled like this, you knew that she was a person that you could hire. She takes this jar and she breaks it open. One moment, extravagant worship, and a symbol that Jesus sees of complete repentance, a desire to leave her old life and to never go back to it again. It says in verse 38, and I just imagine that she can't stop crying this whole time. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. There was no towel to dry her feet, so she just did all she could think of. I actually love this idea that she didn't think it all through. It's like, you know, she had this idea that she was going to come and that she was just going to throw her feet, you know, at Jesus' feet. I'm going to break the jar, but she hadn't gotten past that. It's like this is all she could think of. And all of a sudden she gets here in the moment, she's like, well, I should have probably brought a towel. And then she does something else that can seem so simple to us. Now, you know, I love my, my wife's hair. Um, I've seen it, if you didn't know, at one point she had like real short hair and I thought it was beautiful. Um, her hair has been really long. Her hair has been curly. I love it when she does it in a ponytail. Any way she puts it, I think it's beautiful. So when your wife asks you, does my hair look beautiful? The answer is yes, because we truly find it beautiful however you do it. But for a Jewish woman to unbind her hair and to let it down and to be seen in her culture, it was unthinkable. It was another unthinkable act that she was doing. Verse 39, when the Pharisees who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Simon assumed that Jesus didn't realize who this woman was or what she did for a living. There's no way that he could be a God and no way that he could be a prophet. And Jesus basically here reads his mind and says, yeah, well, I'll show you. Then he, who is Jesus, turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Before I say anything else, so many times in life, we get so worried about judging a person based upon their choices. And I challenge you to hear these words that Jesus says. Even when a person thinks different than you or chooses something different than you, to see the person, to look at their eyes and recognize that they are loved dearly by Jesus and they're invited by Jesus. But he says, do you see this woman? I came into your house and did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. As her great love has shown, he saw her repentance. He saw her pouring herself out. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Why did this woman come and do this? You know, 
why would she do this? She's going across town. And like I said, she was perhaps being jeered by men, perhaps trying to be hired by men. Woman, perhaps, that she was walking past, said unkind words towards her, and she went all the way across town because I'm guessing that Simon the Pharisee didn't live in the red light district. He comes all the way across to a different part of town. And the Pharisee, who wouldn't even walk on the same side of the street of her, she walks uninvited into her, his home, walks through the porch, and darts straight to Jesus. Something the Pharisees considered not just scandalous, disgraceful, but possibly even worthy of being stoned, her life being taken. But I keep on asking this question this week of why? Why would she do this? Why would she choose to run across town and put herself in what could be seen as danger? And so I continued to actually read through until I got to a commentary, and it connected some dots. You see, earlier in this story in Luke, it says that Jesus is with John the Baptist's disciples. And then when he comes uh, with the disciples, they ask Jesus a question. That same question is in Matthew chapter 11, but there's a little bit more of the story of what Jesus says. And so if you kind of try and connect the dots of the timeline, Jesus earlier that day, perhaps earlier in the week, was with John the Baptist and his disciples, and they asked him a question. And there's more to the story in Matthew 11. What was it in this message? What was it that Jesus talked about that we do know that timeline? John the Baptist's disciples ask a question. Later that evening, the woman darts in the house. And here's the rest of the message from Matthew 11. Because Jesus says to everyone, you're invited. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you you rest. What was it that made this woman want to run through town, run to this person's house, and fall at the feet of Jesus? It was this simple message that we hear from Matthew 11 that was before this event in the timeline. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Can you feel the love in those words that she felt when she heard them spoke by Jesus? Come to me, all who are wrecked. Come to me, all who are overcome with guilt. Come to me, all who are tried of trying to be good enough. Come to me, all who are never living up to the expectations of other, never less the expectations that we see in 613 laws from God. Come to me, all who are burdened by shame. Come to me, all who religion has turned away. Come to me, all those who didn't wear the right clothes or didn't do the right cleansing. Come to me, all who were told that you are not invited into God's house or into a Pharisee's house. Come to me because someone didn't understand the love of God and I want you to know that God loves you. Come to me, all those that feel like they have nothing left. Come to me when you've lost all hope. This is the message that she heard from Jesus Christ. When everything in you feels desperate and doesn't know if you can go on, where do you go to? You go to Jesus and you don't worry about who you have to go past. You don't worry about what you have to go through to get there. You don't worry about what it's going to be like when you get there. All you think about is coming to be with Jesus Christ and being with Him. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. You see, that's the reason why she ran across town. That's the reason why she darted into the house. Because Jesus says, you're still invited. You're always invited to be with Jesus. My Father sent me to tell you he loves you, Jesus declared. That you are invited into God's house and you are invited into God's family. Now let me show you something that I, I found really challenging this week. Pointing out the woman's sins didn't lead her away from her sins. Judging her lifestyle didn't change her lifestyle. Shaming her didn't set her free. What changed her was the open invitation to come to the feet of Jesus. The open invitation to come worship 
Jesus, the open invitation to come into God's house, the open invitation to be invited into God's family. And Jesus invites those that other people re reject. That's the core message of the gospel. Even if you've doubted God, questioned God, maybe you feel like you've been hurt by God. You've tried to walk away from God. You feel like maybe God's failed you or you've failed God. That you're still invited to be a part of God's family. Maybe you filed for bankruptcy. You've considered suicide. You've cursed God. You've committed adultery. You are welcome into God's family. You are welcome into God's house. You see, there's a core message that Jesus tells us over and over in nearly every single gospel. And that is that Jesus didn't come for the righteous, but he came for the sinners. In Matthew 9, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does this teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call the righteous. And I have come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Mark 2, Jesus says, on hearing this, Jesus told them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. In our passage today in Luke 7, he says, those who have been forgiven much, that they will love much. So come with your doubts, come with your fears, come with your addictions, come with your rejection, come with all the baggage that you have. But here's the rest of the story, that Jesus compels us to not come alone, but to bring others with you. You see, the rest of the story that we were in a couple weeks ago of Luke 14 tells a parable of a wedding. And Jesus, or in this parable, God, or the, the owner, sends people out and says, invite everybody that you know. Invite everybody that you know to come be at this wedding banquet, to come into my house. Invite everybody. And those that they knew, they went and invited. The one guy said, I I'm sorry, I've got work stuff. I, I, I can't go. Another guy said, I'm sorry, I, I can't go. I bought a donkey and I haven't given him a test drive yet. I've got to go try out the donkey. That's actually what the scripture says. I'm not making that one up. Um, another person says, I just got married and I've got to go be with my wife. Well, I think they got to work on their stuff because normally you bring your wife with you to the wedding banquet. But, you know, that was his excuse. The other person said, I just purchased new land that I haven't seen yet. I mean, every excuse that you can imagine that they had work, that they had relationships. Uh, we maybe don't have donkeys today, but the excuses haven't changed. And Jesus responds and says that the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come so that my house will be full. He says, invite the cripple, invite the lame, invite the blind, invite those that others reject. Invite everybody to come into the house of the Lord. There's still room. Compel them to come in because the party will never be full. Compel the hurting, compel those others reject, compel them to the kingdom of God. That we can just feel the love that Jesus tries to show us in story after story after story. And I'm here to tell you, there's still room. There's still room. If you look around our room, we still have room. If you look in God's house, there's always enough room. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how you feel there's still room for you. I want to close with this last thing that I want to share with you for the first time as a church. We've been working all summer long on getting our church to the place that we actually have um, some order to how we do church. Um, within the Evangelical Covenant, we do a constitution and bylaw that many churches do. The reason why we do that is so the authority does not rest in a single individual or a pastor or even a small group of people, but the authority of the church rests in the body of the church. And so many of you have been a part of churches perhaps that had membership, maybe you haven't. And prayerfully over the summer, we had these ideas that seemed crazy at first. And we're not asking people to become members of the church. Because when you ask people to become members of the church, it does something. It makes you inclusive. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is not to be inclusive. We are going to ask you to be a part of God's church. We are going to have order. We are going to have authority within the body of Christ. But let me share with you the scripture that is taking us where I feel God wants us to go. 2 Corinthians 
517. I'm going to read it from here. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself. That word reconciled is simple. It's basically bringing things back to where they're supposed to be. He reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that we have been brought back to Christ so that we can bring others and invite other people to know Christ. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them, and he was committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So we'll have more details in each of the upcoming three weeks, but we're asking you to commit to say, I'm in to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ through Rock Harbor Church. So if people say, well, are you a member of the church? We can say, no, we don't have members, but I'm an ambassador of my church. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. That I'm not a part of being inclusive, invited to a club that no one else can come into, but we're ambassadors on behalf of Jesus Christ because we believe that I was invited into God's family not because I earned it, not because I deserved it, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for me and my sins have been forgiven because I knelt down at the feet of Jesus and I confessed my sins and I worship Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have the opportunity to invite others, to compel other people to come be a part of what God is doing. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw people, that you would invite us to your family today. And God, I wonder just how many people right now, you know, those that say that, we're followers of Christ, that we are ambassadors of Christ. But how many people today, right now, they have someone on their heart that they want to see come be a part of God's family? So I want you just to think for a second and say, God, who is it that you are compelling me to invite? God, who do you want me to be an ambassador of? Who do you want me to go out there and represent Jesus Christ? And God, we think about the idea that when you walk into the U.S. Embassy in the middle of Moscow, that you're on American soil. That God, that we want to be a place that when people walk onto this property, they come into this house, Lord, they feel as if they're walking into the place the kingdom of God is present. That God, that we can be a place that we can go out of this building and represent you. But when people come here, they know that they are safe. They know they will hear only from the word of God and not from anyone's opinions. That they're coming into a place where God's authority reigns. And God, that authority does not rest in one individual or a small group of people, but it's going to rest in the body of Christ as we come together as a church. So if you're just kind of processing that right now, if, if you think of the person that God wants you to invite, who is God asking you to invite into his family? Maybe it's your husband, maybe it's your child, maybe it's your mom or dad or your next door neighbor. But right now, would you just in your heart, just lift that name up to God. Just lift that name up and say, God, compel me to reach out and to love this person. God, we pray today that you would inspire us as your family to so fall in love with your kingdom. That God, that we want to invite people to be a part of your party. I mean, it's crazy, God, that you've given us this language in your scripture that you want us to invite people into a party and people say, religion is just going to control me. That, God, we get to tell them the truth. No, it's not like that. Jesus wants you to come and repent because he wants to give you a lifestyle that is better. He doesn't want to love you in your sin, but he wants to love you with where you are, forgive you for your sins, And he wants our hearts to break as much as that jar broke. There's no going back to the lifestyle before. There's no going back to choosing anything but following Jesus. I'm going to choose to follow him every single day. God, as we embrace this challenge, this idea of becoming an ambassador of Jesus Christ through our church. God, just make us a living letter, a living imitation, showing the grace the beauty, the love, the transforming power of your risen son, Jesus. 
We pray, God, for those that we know and love that don't yet know you. God, we won't judge their lifestyle, but we will lead them to you. Let you heal them. Let you forgive them and let you convict them. God, make us new, oh God, that we need your grace. So God, that we can compel others to know you. As we keep praying today, Lord, there may be some who hear this message and they, they came in feeling unworthy. And perhaps, God, you're speaking to their heart right now and you're saying, no, you are so worthy. You are so worthy. If anybody right now is hearing anything other than the truth, that you are so worthy to come before Jesus Christ, we pray in the name of Jesus that we renounce any lie that has been spoken over you. Anyone who said something to you that you're not good enough, in the name of Jesus, we declare that you are more than good enough, not because of what you've done, but because of what he has done. Yes, it is true, you could never save yourself. You can never have your sins forgiven. But through the power of Jesus Christ, it can be done in this moment, at this very second. All you have to do is cry out, Jesus, I believe in you. Symbolically run to the feet of Jesus and worship him and pour yourself out to him. It doesn't matter what you've done. Anyone who calls on the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus will be forgiven, be saved, and transformed. If that's you, just declare, I need your mercy. He invites you to turn from your old life. The old has gone, the new is ready to become. Therefore, in Christ, you can be a new creation. If that's you, then right now, let's, let's say that prayer together. Church, let's stand together. Let's stand before God as we pray to Him. I believe that right now, there's some people who have some chains that need to be broken. There's some bondages, there's lies that have been spoken over you that need to be broken. I can't do it. No matter how great this worship song is that we sing here in a second, it's not going to do it. No one else can do it but Jesus Christ. And you know what, that, that, that phrase has actually scared me a lot in the past few months. Because only through Jesus has this church been built. Only through Jesus will this church continue. And some days that scares me. But we can just go and just sit at the feet of Jesus and know that I'm so thankful that only through Christ can this happen. So if you wanna say this prayer with us this morning, declare that Jesus is the Lord of your life, I'm gonna invite you to say it with us but let's not have anyone say it alone. So if you're a follower of Christ and you wanna to continue to say this prayer with us, let's say this together. Pray, Heavenly Father, forgive all my sins, change my heart, accept me now, Jesus, make me new. Fill me with your spirit so I can know you and walk with you and serve you and compel others to know you. My life is not my own. I give it all to you. Thank you for this new life because of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name, it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven, and I'll pray this for you. I'll pray for your healing, the circumstances would change. I'll pray that the fear inside would flee. Jesus name I pray that a breakthrough would happen today I pray miracles over your life in Jesus name in Jesus name I speak the name of all authority 
Declaring blessings every promise He is faithful to keep I speak the name no grave could ever hold Cause He is greater, He is stronger He's the God of possible I pray for your healing The circumstances would change Circumstances for change. 